All right, ladies and gentlemen, here we go. We're playing white against a 2286. All right, this is the highest rated person we faced thus far. And I'm going to switch back to one E4. We've done D4 a couple of games in a row. Let's go back to E4 and see how our openings hold up at a very high level. Well, we are going to stick to our guns. I'm going to play the Smith Mora, which is kind of a scary prospect because I don't know the Smith Mora well enough, I think, to justify playing it at this level. But if we lose, you know, if, if Black demonstrates a superior knowledge of the opening, then so be it. Okay, I'm actually happy to see Knight F6 because this transposes the game into a, an Alep and Sicilian, as you guys know. The move here is E5. And most Smith Mora players are disappointed when they see the declined Mora, when they see the move Knight F6. But in reality, the Alapin is in and of itself a very entertaining opening. And I've played it religiously in previous speedruns, and I feel like I know it a lot better than I know the Mora. So in this position, there is basically three moves. Um, Queen takes D4 is a sideline that contains a lot of venom. I know Mark recommends it. I don't know it well at all. Queen takes d4 is very interesting line to explore. Now, most people play c takes d4, but the, the modern treatment of the position is actually to start with the flexible knight f3, exploiting the fact that d takes c3 is impossible because the pawn is pinned to the knight. So knight f3 is, is what almost everybody nowadays plays as a matter of course. d6, yeah, so this is one of several possible lines. And now, and now we play c takes d4, we recapture the pawn, and the main line is knight c6 in this position. Now we're just following main line theory. And does anybody know what the main move here is for white? It's very important to be precise, because otherwise white runs the risk of essentially overextending the center and getting some sort of crappy IQP position. So a lot of people here, they default to the move e takes d6, but that is exactly the kind of crappy IQP position you want to avoid. Uh, knight c3 is not great because black takes on c3, and then I think plays d takes e5. We'll check that after the game. Knight c3 actually might be kind of interesting, but the main move is bishop c4, developing with tempo and immediately harassing the knight on d5. Now we drive the bishop to b5, now d takes e5, knight takes e5, bishop d7 is main line. White gets the two bishops, knight takes d7, queen takes d7. White gets the two bishops and an active position, but in return, we are saddled with a, an IQP. And that IQP does become a potential liability in certain positions. So we need to continue following the main line here. The move is knight c3, uh, threatening d5. And essentially this forces black's hand, which is e6. Now we castle. And the traditional main line is bishop e7. That is what people used to play automatically. People still play it. It's still, it's still very much a reputable move, but I think white is slightly better, according to modern theory. Recently, top GMs have been playing a couple of different moves in this position. I don't know exactly what is the most popular right now. I know that a6 has been tested uh, at, at the top level. I know also rook d8 is a move. Yeah, rook d8 is on the board. And here, kind of, we're on our own. At this point, I'm, I'm no longer overly familiar with the theory. So let's try to figure it out uh, over the board. Yeah, so rook d8 is, uh, is lo totally logical. It, it, it attacks the d4 pawn. Now black is threatening to capture d4 with the queen. Now what you, should, what you should understand about these lines is that sometimes you sacrifice the pawn on d4 for an initiative. So the prospect of black taking on d4 before castling isn't the scariest prospect. Like, imagine if black plays queen takes d4 here. Imagine that it's black to move. Well, we can meet queen takes d4 with queen f3, and black's queen on d4 is kind of a sitting duck in the center. So it's not the end of the world that the pawn is attacked, but that doesn't mean we should just give it away for free. We should at least see if we can develop a tempo. So some of you might be tempted by the move bishop g5. But that's a little bit myopic because then black responds with bishop e7. And remember that in an IQP structure, trades generally favor the side that faces the isolated queen pawn. So instead, I think we should go bishop e3. As passive as this move looks, it's still a developing move and it fulfills the job of defending the d4 pawn. Bishop e7. 
Okay, now we can rewind a move. And I will remind you that bishop e7 here, which is the traditional main line, is generally met with queen g4. That is the theoretical continuation. So we should test the move queen g4 here. Oh, well, queen g4 here, black will castle, and then in comparison to the other position, it seems like black has made an improvement. Like the in insertion of rook d8, bishop e3 is probably in black's favor because bishop h6 is no longer possible in that situation due to queen takes d4. Let's see if we can try to improve on queen g4. Let's see if we can try to find a trickier continuation. I'm actually going to think about this for a couple of moments. I'm going to think about this for about a minute in silence. And then I'll share my thoughts with you. And I encourage you to do the same, by the way. Let's play rook c1. Let's play rook c1. Which is a move that some of you suggested already previously. The idea of this move is to put pressure on the knight on c6, and I'm basically trying to stay flexible here. Yeah, queen g4, I didn't really see a clear follow-up after castle. So though if black castle is here, we might still play queen g4 in order to vacate the d1 square for the other rook. I, like, ideally, we don't want the queen to be on d1. We want the f rook to be on d1 because it's a more effective defender of the pawn. Okay, black does castle. But obviously, queen g4 is not forced. Like, we have... Many possible continuations. Also interesting is queen h5. Trying to develop the queen onto a somewhat more aggressive square. Definitely worthy of consideration. Although queen h5, black can play a6. And after the trade, I don't really see a clear continuation. Yeah, queen f3 is also interesting to pressure the knight on c6 into a kind of semi-threatened bishop takes c6, which would cripple black's queenside pawn structure. That actually might be, ooh, but it's, it comes to a tactic. Queen f3, there's knight takes d4. And I think the complications work out for black. I think I see another way. No, but that doesn't work either. Let's think. Knight, knight e4 walks into f5, which I think could be pretty nasty. Knight a4, black plays knight d5 and establishes a knight in the center. Yeah, I think we should just resign. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, this is such a tricky line. This rook d8 move, I, I'll have to update my, my theoretical knowledge, which is already scant to begin with. But this just seems like we have absolutely nothing. Okay, we need to somehow find a way to... No, I think the position is equal. We need to find a way at least to create some trouble for black. Knight e4, this f5 move is so annoying. Knight c5, bishop c5, dc, knight d5. Just looks like white is worse there. Queen g4, again, he, got, he has f5. Ah, but maybe there we can drop the queen back to f3. Then black plays f4. Ugh. Then black plays f4. So queen g4, f5, queen g3. But if, and if a6, maybe we can take, and then perhaps we can exploit the weakness of the, of the pawn. But after queen g4, the problem is also that black can just play a6. And if we play bishop h6, ah, then bishop f6, maybe we can play bishop takes c6. Okay, let's give it a shot. Let's give queen g4 a shot. And, and probably that basically means that rook c1 was a mistake. I think what I should have done is just gone queen g4, castles, and then rook a to d1. Because now we have to worry about the weakness of the spawn. Whereas if the rook was on d1, you know, that would be a much safer option. Rook c1 was 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 short-sighted gosh people are uh people are beasts in the opening everybody knows they're chessable except yours yours truly yeah well the problem with a6 bishop d3 is twofold the first is that we relinquish control over the d4 pawn the second is that this idea of black going f5 is super super nasty because although the move f5 weakens the e6 pawn and that's the main drawback of that move it potentially just pries our fingers from the ledge because if black can play f5 and then f4 dislodging the bishop from e3 if the bishop has to drop back to d2 then again all of this comes down to the weakness of the d4 pawn we must keep this pawn protected at all costs the good news though is that we finally gotten our opponent to think that tells me that we're finally on a level playing field 
And this is where hopefully we can figure out a way to cause trouble here. One move I'm hoping black might play and fall into a trap is the move a6 here. But I don't think he's going to do that. Why is a6 a trap? So if he or she plays a6, then bishop takes c6, queen takes c6. And it may appear that we have no obvious discoveries along the c-file, but we can throw in bishop h6, forcing black to play bishop f6, and then we play the move knight c3 to e4, attacking the queen and threatening to capture the bishop on f6 because, remember, the g-pawn is pinned to the king. Yeah, of course, after a6, bishop takes c6, black should play pawn takes, but that is the ideal scenario. If we can force bishop takes c6 bc, then at least we have created a corresponding weakness in black's position, right? Then we'll have mutual weaknesses. We'll have the IQP. Black will have a weak pawn on c6, right? Okay, so our opponent is still deep in the tank, which is good. Maybe queen g4 is not as uh, shabby as it may appear. It's actually not so simple for black also to choose a move here. It's like a very, very... Okay, king h8. So our opponent chooses a very, like, slow positional option. That gives us the time we need to bring the rook to d1 and protect the pawn on d4, which makes me a lot less worried about the prospect of f5. It's still an annoying move, but after f5, we can drop our queen back to g3, and f4, of course, is not really possible because if bishop takes f4. Okay. So I think we've stabilized the position. It's probably still equal, like... Probably all 0, 0, 0, but lots of possibilities here to outplay somebody. Okay, so what other observations are we making here? Well, we've got our pieces on nice squares. We've got our rook on nice... I guess I'm kind of reserving my, my thinking until black's move, because black's move will completely change how we approach this position. Like, the move f5 here is completely different from the move a6. From a general perspective, it would be nice if at some point we could make some luft with h3 or even with g3. It would also be nice... I mean, probably the ideal square for the queen at this point is f3. The queen has done its job on g4. Once the black king has moved away from g8, the queen on g4 is sort of a sitting duck. It's not really doing anything. So on f3, it would at least be putting pressure on the knight on c6. Quote-unquote threatening bishop takes c6. Well, are we looking to double rooks here? Eh, I don't think so. I think the d5 square is so well protected by black that hoping to push the d pawn... Okay, maybe we will. I wouldn't rule it out completely. But doubling rooks seems really cumbersome here. I feel like it would give black a lot of time and it would... In basketball, there's the term telegraphing a pass, right? When you hold the basketball over your head and you aim at the player you're trying to pass it to, that often leads to a turnover. In chess, it's kind of similar. In a complicated middle game, if a plan takes too long, you want to make sure that you don't get into a situation where your opponent allows all of the moves you want to make, and then you waste a bunch of tempi, and then your opponent makes one move, and it stops your main concept, if that makes sense. Are you more inclined to this position? Well, g3 versus h3 is kind of arbitrary. The reason I kind of like g3 is that it blunts f5, f4 simultaneously while creating luft. Of course, h3 is the traditional, traditional way of creating luft. But you shouldn't be afraid to play the move g3 if your opponent lacks a light-scored bishop. So I would make this move without a second thought. Of course, it's a little bit weakening. If black had a light-scored bishop lurking somewhere, g3 would be a lot more committal. No, we don't even need to re and keto the bishop. We could just play g3. And black's not going to exploit these squares easily. Well, my cat is Jeff. Hopefully, you're at least able to follow my general statements, you know? I'm trying to be as simple as possible in, in my explanation of how I'm thinking about this position. Knight d5 centralizing the knight. I think we should take that knight. I, I wouldn't want to allow black to establish an incredibly strong piece on d5, and I would much rather deal with a queen on d5 than a knight on d5, because a queen on d5 is not stable. It can be chased away, whereas a knight on d5 causes... A lot of unpleasant externalities in our position. So let's trade. Obviously, ED is terrible because we would trade queens and take twice on c6. Okay, so what do we do now? We have a dilemma. I think the sort of vanilla move is bishop takes c6. 
But then the position becomes very much sterile. I think the position becomes sterile. We each will have a dark squared bishop and black will have a nicely positioned queen on d5. I think we should try to keep our bishop pair and we should try to remove the queen from d5 with bishop c4. Of course, that abandons the possibility of trading on c6. On the other hand, it makes it a more distinct possibility that we might one day be able to eradicate our weakness by pushing d5. So in such complicated middle games, everything is a trade-off, right? And no one move is going to contain all strengths and no weaknesses, right? There's going to be downsides and upsides. And your goal is just to like maximize the upsides and minimize the downsides. Easy, easier said than done, obviously. Queen d6. All right. I like actually seeing this move. I feel like queen d6 is probably not the best spot for the queen. And maybe, just maybe, this gives us the chance to start accumulating a little bit of an initiative here. Now, the first thing that everybody should see is, of course, the possibility of d5. Unfortunately, I think d5 fails because of knight e5. Then black takes the bishop on c4 and follows up with e takes d5. I'll make all these moves after the game on the board. Tree Potato, thank you for the sub. So there's a couple of moves that are catching my eye here. One of them is, hmm. So we should still remember that f5 is a potentially annoying possibility. One possibility we have is to play queen g4 to e4 in order to centralize our queen so that after d5, knight e5 no longer comes with tempo. The other reason I like queen e4 is because, of course, it potentially sets up a battery with bishop d3. So we can also play queen h5 for the same reasons. But the reason I like queen e4 a little bit more is because it discourages, although it doesn't prevent f5, it only discourages it. Hmm. Let's think about this for a little while longer. We can also play bishop f4, by the way. But after bishop f4, we abandon... We abandoned this pawn, and I'm not sure I like that. We can also make a very calm move, like a3. We can just continue improving our position. There's nothing wrong with that. And at this point, we can also try to double our rooks with rook d2, or even rook d3. Taking that avenue of thought, I'm starting to come up with an interesting concept. Now, this is a risky concept, but I think it might pay off. Yeah, rook d3, knight b4, we go bishop f4 with tempo, and then swing the rook to h3. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's risk it. Here we go. Now, I'm positive this is not the... Oh, and I should have gone rook c3. No, but rook c3, there was knight e5. Wow, that's really cool, actually. Had we played instead rook to c3 with the same idea of lifting the rook up to h3, black would have had this weird-looking move knight c6 to e5, forcing a favorable trade because the knight would have been untouchable because the rook on d1 would be a sitting duck. Well, the point is we go rook h3 and we go for checkmate. At some point, we will end up sacrificing the pawn on d4. It's only a question of when we sacrifice it, not a question of whether we sacrifice it. The good thing about sacking the pawn on d4 is that once it is captured, the center opens up, and if black's king is weak, then you might get a situation where black is overextended, right? Opening up the center generally favors the attacking side in... Okay, that's a why. Obviously, depends on the position. But in this type of position, given that black lacks a light squared bishop, and given that black's queen is in alignment with the rook, I feel like even if black captures d4, in some situations, it could lead to black being overextended. I think you know what I'm saying. And also the bishop pair, right? We have the, what I was trying to say is that we have the bishop pair. And that is what could benefit us in the event of the center opening up. Now, we should also keep in mind, as Black is thinking, that we don't need to rush with the move bishop f4, right? We can also play a little bit more slowly. We can double rooks on the d file. We're under no obligation to follow through on our plan in case Black does something drastic or crazy. And I talked about this in the last speedrun game, right? You have to be flexible. Once you make a move that has an idea, that doesn't mean you have to follow up on that idea no matter what. And I think this might be a case in point. Bishop f6 is a great move by our opponent. Great move by our opponent. I think the point is to play g6 and to build a defensive construction to re-fianchetto the bishop. 
And actually here, I think it's much more prudent for us to, ooh, wait, there's a nasty idea there. Wait a minute, let's think. It's much more prudent for us to not go bishop f4. I don't think bishop f4 is a good idea here. Actually, maybe it is. Let's see, there, 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 there. No, it isn't, it isn't. Wow, there's a ridiculous tactic here. I'm trying to figure out a way to circumvent this tactic. Gosh, bishop f6 is such a good move. This kind of sours the party, to be honest. Queen e4 maybe is also interesting. I have to say I'm getting outplayed. I'm just getting soundly outplayed here. Yeah, I blundered. If rook d1, there's this weird move queen b4, and then if bishop b3, he's got knight e5. And black wins in exchange in the game. Right, bishop f6, I totally underestimated. Let's go queen e4. No, no, it's just that there are various people here. People at this level are, like, ridiculously strong. But, okay, the game is not over. I mean, we just need to find a way to keep our d4 pawn protected. Bishop b5? But that just encourages black to take the pawn on d4. The point of queen e4 is to aim at the b7 pawn. That's my thinking. My thinking is to discourage knight takes d4, because then maybe we'll take on b7. Or, by keeping our pieces clumped together like this, we're ensuring that there's going to be less tactics having to do with undefended pieces. So, for instance, after knight d4, maybe we'll play rook c to d1. Double rooks try to provoke black into playing e6, e5, and then grab the pawn on b7. And in that case, I think it's anybody's game. Yeah, but the problem is that there's bishop takes d4. And the inclusion of the dark squared bishop trade is definitely in black's favor, no doubt about it. But what I calculated was bishop takes d4, Bishop takes d4, knight takes d4, rook c to d1, doubling rooks and attacking the knight. Black has to play e5, and then we grab the pawn on b7. And I wouldn't say that white is better there, but I think we're probably not worse in that resulting position. I think white can more or less hope to keep the balance there. Black is also getting a little bit low. I mean, we're both getting low on time, but obviously it's going to favor us. If, if uh, black gets, let's say, under three minutes. Yeah, I'm definitely unhappy with the quality of this game so far. I, I don't know exactly what I did wrong, but just get the sense that I am not feeling this position as well as our opponent, but that's, that's fine. The game Again, the game continues. So my guess is that our opponent is trying to decide which piece to capture on d4 with. So this guy's blitz rating is 22, 21. So in the event of, let's say, uh, both of us being under a minute, I'd be pretty confident of my chances. But obviously that's not how we want to win most of our speedrun games. We want to win them on the board. But that doesn't mean, you know, the time is never a factor and that I'm going to deny that in the speedrun. Most, most people watching it are trying to improve precisely at this time control, maybe 15 minutes maximum. So you should be keeping an eye on the way that we're managing our clock. IQP structures. And when I say IQP, by the way, those listening on YouTube, isolated queen pawn, IQP. This is an IQP structure. And the reason it has its own name, like why is IKP not a thing? Of course, it can be a thing. You could have an isolated king pawn, but the IQP structure arises a lot more commonly out of a lot of different types of openings. Karo Khan, Nimzo Indian. After the game, I'll show you a couple of ways that you could get the same IQP position out of like three or four different openings. And IQPs are very hard to play for both sides. Both sides, you know, you really have to study these structures carefully to learn how to play them with, with, with either side. There's books that are written exclusively on IQP structures. Now, rook d7 is not scary. Notice that we're also sort of eyeing the move d4, d5. Yeah, the guy is in the tank. He's under two minutes. And bishop takes d4. Wow. Good stuff by our opponent. Okay. I think we should stick to our guns here. The thing is, if we start with rook c to d1, then black has e5. And unfortunately, the move order is in black's favor. But one interesting alternative that I'm coming up with right now is 
a somewhat more brazen option, which is rook cd1, e5, and then bishop g5, trying to keep the bishop pair, preserve the bishop pair. Black moves the rook. We swing our rook to h3, threatening checkmate. Black plays h6. And then we try to keep the attack going with a move like queen f5. Ooh, there are some interesting tactics there. You know what, ladies and gentlemen? Given that black is low on time, I'm very tempted to do this. I know it's unsound, though. I know it's unsound, though. So, this might not be exactly in the spirit of the speedrun, but we're going to do it anyway. We are going to do it anyway. Let's do it. Rook cd1. Bishop g5. Okay, buckle your seatbelts. This is going to be a ride. I have a bad feeling about this, but we're in too deep. It's funny, one minute and 40 seconds when you have it seems like nothing, but when your opponent is thinking, you feel like it's an eternity. It's like he's got so much time to figure out the defense here. Yeah, rook h3, bishop f2, king f2. And remember that there will be a mate threat on h7. Okay, rook c8. That move I like seeing. I feel like rook d7 would have been a lot better. Okay, so rook h3... Makes a lot of sense. Rook h3, f5, queen h4, h6, though. Uh, we're kind of at a dead end there. Hmm. Wait, let's not rush. I can, there's a couple of other moves here that are interesting. There's queen f5. So rook h3, h5, f5. If we sack on h7 and then go queen h4 check, then black goes king g6. There I'm afraid we have nothing. It's incredible how solid black's position is. It's like... Okay, well, we kind of have to go rook h3. We kind of have to. I really don't see an alternative. We have to move first and then think later. <laughs> okay, if black goes f5 here, I think we're going to drop our queen back to e2 and just try to play positionally. Because remember, we have only sacrificed a pawn. I think a lot of people in these situations, they start to panic completely because they're like, oh, if the attack doesn't work out, we lose. No, we don't lose. We're, we're only down upon. We still have the bishop pair. We still have active pieces. So sometimes knowing when to retreat and just keep the tension, that can be a lot more unpleasant for a person who is in time pressure. You should know this than tactical moves that lead to forcing positions. Okay. Oh my gosh, wait. Oh, wait. Wait, 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 there's an idea. Does this work? Oh my God, if this works. Oh my God, it, does this actually work? Wait a, wait a minute. If this works, this is going to be like the greatest combination of the speed run. But I'm pretty sure it doesn't. It can't work. And yet I can't refute it. Are you kidding me? Okay, we're trying it. Maybe this loses. So queen g6... Rook h7 check, sacking the rook in the end game. Now, if this loses, don't be too angry at me. And rook d3, trying to lift the rook to h3 with mate. I don't see a defense against this. Now, there is bishop takes f2 check, obviously. I saw that. We step aside to h1, and here's the crazy thing. Now, listen very carefully. Here's the crazy thing. After bishop takes f2 check, king h1. There is the move bishop h4, which looks like it wins the game for black because, well, rook h3 is no longer a check and black back rank mates us on f1. And yet he doesn't. After bishop h4, rook h3, the bishop from c4 guards f1 and the bishop simultaneously defends g8. I think the best that black can do is basically to lose a piece. I think we're winning. Oh my God, this is beautiful. This is very uncommon to have a combination like this in the end game. It's crazy how this works out. He's down to 20 seconds. I don't think he sees a defense either. There is rook f4 here. But after rook f4, we still go rook h3. Nothing helps. All right, there we go. Rook h3, rook f4, and bishop takes f4. Bishop takes g5, and we win a piece. It worked. Okay, now all we need, or did it work? Wait. Not yet. I guess we can't celebrate just yet. Oh my god. Is he actually defending? Wait, wait, wait. Oh my god. A bishop f7 almost works. 
Wait, wait, there, there must be a win here. Let's just calm down and find it. Okay, I found it. I found it. All we need to do, so here's the thing. If we play rook takes h4 check, that would be terrible. Because black goes king g6, and you guys should see that both bishops are hanging. So what we need to do is somehow defend one of the bishops first with an intermediate move, and we have a simple intermediate move. Bishop d3 check, and that's it. Then we rook, play rook takes h4, and the other bishop defends the c1 square. At, the bishop on d3 defended f1, the bishop on g5 defends c1, and black loses a piece. Unbelievable. Okay, I am super pumped that we just had this. This is, um, I'm going to clickbait the heck out of this on YouTube. That's it. King g8. Rook takes h4, no back rank mate, we're up a piece. And all we need to do is just be careful and not blunder anything here. Knight e6 attacks the bishop. The biggest shame would be to screw this up now. <laughs> okay, so in such situations, again, as I've indicated previously, the simplest is just to go for immediate and maximal piece simplification. So if you really want to do this properly, then perhaps the best move is bishop f5 or bishop c4, either way, trading the bishop for the knight. But we could also choose to keep the bishop pair alive, which is probably more objectively accurate, and that would mean playing bishop e3. But I think that, given that we don't want to screw this up, given that we want to choose the simplest option, I think bishop f5 is the safest. Just making sure that the bishop still controls the back rank square. It's always dangerous to play without Luft like this. Just dub always double check that the back rank square is, prote is still protected. That's it. We won. And we're over 2200. <laughs> All right, we'll check with the engine, of course, but I'm pretty sure that the, that the combination was sound. Okay, we've got a lot to analyze. First thing I'm going to do is pull out my C3 Sicilian book. It's called Squeezing the Sicilian, that's right, Seth, by Alexander Kalifman. So D4, C, D, and C3. I think this guy was the first person to decline the Mora in all of the speedrun, which is kind of weird. So E5, Knight D5, Knight F3, D6... C takes d4. Um, we're going to skip right to the crux of the matter. Now, if, if you're on YouTube or you're new to this line and you're getting overwhelmed, you can look all of this up on your own, but we basically followed the traditional main line all the way up until rook d8. So I've had a couple of games in the database in this position. And just to um, make sure that we're all on the same page, as I indicated during the game, bishop e7 is what people used to play exclusively. And the line goes as follows. We go queen g4, black castles. Now, you might say, wait a second, bishop h6 wins the exchange. In fact, bishop h6 is a blunder. Can anybody tell me why? Why is bishop h6 a blunder? And even some GMs have accidentally made this move. Well, it's a blunder. It's a small blunder. It doesn't lose the game on the spot or anything, but it... It loses a pawn. Yeah, queen takes d4. Queen takes d4. The queen defends g7. The knight defends the queen, and the queen attacks the other queen. So white has no time to take on c6 here. So for that reason, the main move is to start with bishop takes c6. Now, queen takes c6 is widely considered to be a mistake, because after bishop h6, bishop f6, rook fd1... There is a very, very nasty idea where white goes knight c3 to e4 on the next move, putting pressure on the bishop. Like, even if black steps aside with the king, we can still play knight e4. And this is a very nasty situation for black because, well, I'm going to play knight takes f6 on the next move, and there's nothing you can do about it. Um, if rook g8, I think three games in the database went bishop g5, and black is... You can major trouble here all of a sudden. Takes, takes, and queen h5, and you're starting to lose all of your pawns. So it's important for black to play the move bc, because in comparison, after bishop f6, again, you don't have time to play knight e4, because black can grab the pawn on d4. I don't remember with which piece, but I think actually maybe with the queen. And black is fine here. So white has to waste the tempo on the move rook fd1, giving black the opportunity to shift the king over to h8. After knight e4, you have the time to slide your queen to e7. This is actually the move that we were lacking with the queen sitting on c6. 
This queen d7 to e7 defensive move is very, very important. Ton of games in the database here. Uh, but I, I'm pretty sure that after bishop g5, white has a small pull. This is a, a more pleasant position for white. I, I, and I, I've always enjoyed playing this. Okay. So this is the old main line. But like I said, recently in this position, um, people have been playing... Sorry, in yeah, in this position, people have been playing two other different moves, one of which is a6. The other one is the one that black made in the game, which is rook d8. Let's start by checking the book. After rook d8, the Califman book recommends the following line. Okay, the recommendation is indeed bishop e3. So that is indeed the recommendation. Bishop e7. There's a couple of alternatives. If black plays a6, then after bishop c6, queen c6, rook c1, creating the pin, knight d5. And queen comes out to g4 to delay the development of the bishop. h5, queen g5, with a small initiative for white, according to the authors. So bishop e7 is indeed the main move in the book as well. And now, okay, so queen g4 is their recommendation. Califman's recommendation is indeed queen g4. Um, so rook c1 is where we deviate. They don't mention rook c1. And I think this move is completely toothless. The only other move they mention is queen to b3. After queen b3, black's task would be simpler. Castles, rook fd1, and now the simplest is just knight d5, leading to a bunch of exchanges. Takes, 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 takes. Rook ac1, rook a5, a3, rook c8 equals in the game. Butescu against Vol, Correspondence 2016. As you guys know, if there's a bunch of correspondence games in a line, that basically means that it's the best line. So what our opponent played is probably what black is should play. So after queen g4, sorry, after queen g4 in this position, black castles and white goes rook a to d1. This is the line in the book. Bishop, uh, sorry, g6 is the main line. If black plays f5, then the queen drops back to f3. And if bishop f6, white can break through with d5. Knight d5, knight d5, he takes d5. And who can spot the cute little move here for white? Yeah, at my level, like at this level, you know, if you're 2200 and, and you played a game like this, this is what you're supposed to do. You open up, you crack open your book, and then you figure out where you went wrong. No, queen takes, you play queen takes. No, bishop c4, I think black can play, let's see, it's not bishop c4. Okay, I think black can play knight e7 here. It's bishop takes a7. Yeah, it's bishop takes a7. The, the benefit of this move isn't just that it wins the pawn back. It's also that the bishop can drop back to b6, attack the rook. Why is attacking the rook important? Because if the rook moves, then black loses d5. So bishop a7 is what they give uh, with a small advantage for white. So for that reason, instead of bishop f6, Instead of bishop take bishop f6, the best move is knight d5, and this actually equalizes. Yeah, so according to the authors, black actually equalizes with this line. Takes, 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 with another one of these typical toothless positions, equal. Yeah, black can equalize with castles and with a move f5 in this position. But that requires very advanced theoretical knowledge. Black would have to know all of this topical stuff. And if black plays g6, then we respond with d5. Knight takes d5, and again, this bishop takes a7 idea. This, by the way, is how opening knowledge is acquired at a high level. Not only are we looking at the theory, and I know you're probably bored to death, but we're also loading ourselves up with typical ideas. See, now you're not going to forget about this idea of going d5 and taking on a7. So it's a double kind of type of learning. Yeah, you're learning theory, but you're also learning typical ideas that occur several times in the line. Anyways, queen g4 is probably white's best attempt. I think after rook c1 castles, white is the one struggling to equalize. So we played queen g4. Black responds with king h8, which I thought was a really good move because it takes this thing out of bishop h6. Um, the trap, by the way, that I was hoping black might fall into is a6 and here to illustrate what i showed what i talked about during the game bishop c6 and if queen takes c6 
Obviously, like, this never works because the queen can take the knight. So you play bishop h6, forcing the black bishop to f6. And now if you've been paying attention, you should know what the move is. Now the move is knight e4. Attacking the queen. And if the queen moves, you take the bishop with mate. So black loses the game. Balu says, yep, no idea what's going on. Uh, in which position are you confused? I would ignore, if you're like not a C3 Sicilian player, you could like 2x speed the last like two or three minutes. Uh, but now we get to the fun part, which is actually the game continuation. So King H8, I think, is a very vigilant move. As I was discussing during the game, I was also concerned about the prospect of playing F5. And um, here we would have had to decide where we want to put our queen. Probably we would have put our queen on g3 yeah g3 or f3 but the problem with queen f3 is i was worried about this move f4 i was worried about the prospect of f4 and here white is experiencing problems because if bishop takes f4 there might be a way to win the bishop actually g5 just wins the bishop g5 just wins the bishop um and if white doesn't play bishop takes f4 if white drops the bishop back to d2 the knight takes d4 is incredibly strong, but this blunders the queen. No, it does not, because white's queen is also hanging with check. Black recaptures the bishop, and black is up a pawn. Does that make sense? So therefore, we have to play queen g3. The main difference is that after f4, bishop takes f4, the queen is no longer pinned. And here, white is surviving. White is actually better. But the drawback of queen g3 is that it walks potentially into the move bishop d6 attacking the queen, and reinforcing the threat of f4. But the downside of bishop d6 is that it cuts off black's heavy pieces from aiming at the d4 pawn. So after something like queen h3, black can still play f4, but in this case, we can drop our bishop back to d2, and the pawn on d4 is still alive because the queen is blocked. Does that make sense? Visor Gaming 123 asks us to clarify Queen F3, F4, Bishop F4, G5, Queen G4. I see what you're trying to do here, but remember, after Rook takes F4, you have only one Queen. You can't be pinning the Rook and taking the Rook at the same time. So the Pawn defends the Rook, and if you take it, then Black's Pawn has been unpinned. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. So after F5, I was planning Queen G3, and I think White is okay. Instead, King H8 allows us to bring the rook into the game. And our opponent centralizes the knight with knight d5. As you know, the main rule of playing against the isolated queen pawn is that you want to control the square in front of the pawn with your pieces. If you don't control the square in front of your pawn, you run the risk of allowing a pawn breakthrough. We've already seen the negative, the harmful effects that black can experience if the pawn reaches d5. Okay, knight d5, knight takes d5. Queen takes d5. Obviously, e takes d5 would be a lot worse because we trade queens and we simply win the pawn on c6. So, queen takes d5 is de rigueur. And here we had sort of a major fork in the road. If we wanted to make a draw here, we would take on c6. And then we play a move like b3. Position is completely equal, but I would probably take black here, actually, because black's pieces seem to be a little bit more zesty than whites. And once again, f5 is a potentially annoying move that we have to deal with. So a couple of questions. Afflicted711 asks, why not bishop g5? Where? Can you clarify where? I'm not sure where bishop g5 is appealing to you. I mean, here, if you play bishop g5, there's nothing inherently wrong with this move. It's just that, I mean, it leads to a bunch of trades, and I feel like it's also kind of toothless. Like, bishop takes g5, queen takes g5, black can play queen e7, offering the queen trade. And remember, black is still controlling the square in front of the IQP, so if you just start barreling head first toward an endgame, you're just going to end up being worse. You're just going to end up being worse. Um, I've shown you before the karpov korchnoi game and the IQP, one of the most famous examples of playing against the IQP and the, how harmful it can be for the side with the IQP to trade all the pieces. Sorry, we were here. Um, is bishop e3 a problem piece? Now, bishop e3 is a defensive piece. Remember, defensive pieces have a reason to exist. 
It's not the sexiest piece alive, but it is what's holding together the d4 pawn. I like the placement of this bishop. I think this bishop is sort of the backbone of our position. Okay, takes. Queen takes, and we decided on the more dynamic move, bishop c4. Queen d6. And here, of course, I, I can guarantee you that I made several moves that the engine will be laughing at. Um, it's entirely possible that we should have gone for a something safer, such as just doubling the rooks on the d file to make sure that the d4 pawn is perfectly well protected. I think the position here is about equal, right? It's balanced. We've got the IQP, but we have the bishop pair, and our pieces are relatively active. Um, but instead, we decided on this, you know, very brave approach, rook d3. And to be honest, I just underestimated bishop f6. For some reason, I was, like, only seriously considering the move knight b4. This is what I thought black would play, and I was really hoping that we would get a chance to play bishop f4. And the point of bishop f4 is to attack the queen. And the point of attacking the queen is to open the gates for the white rook to reach h3. And the point of reaching h3 is to develop a direct attack on the h7 pawn. This could lead to checkmate very, very quickly. Maybe black is still like winning after queen takes d4, I don't know. But if black plays rook takes d4, who can tell me how white affects checkmate as quickly as possible. There's basically checkmate in two moves. Not checkmate in two moves, but in two moves you can get a situation where black is helpless against mate. Yeah, queen h5, simple move, h6, and just crash through with bishop takes h6. And if black can defend this, then I, I take my hat off. Okay, maybe g6 keeps black alive for the time being. But even dropping the queen back, let's say, to f3, I think is easy. Because the rook is hanging, and there's a discovery, and this is just over. Um, or, or actually, queen e5 check might be strong as well. Ooh! If you want to simplify queen e5 check... Okay, if king g8, then this is mate. And after f6, there's a very pretty simplifying combination. Queen takes d4. Queen takes d4, and bishop e3 check. Now note that if the black pawn were on f7 in this position, black would have queen h4. And black would be able to restore the material equality. But here the pawn blocks the bishop. So always look for these kinds of simplifying combinations when you are attacking. It's not only about delivering checkmate. So anyways, I was hoping for that. But after bishop f6, this takes this thing out of bishop f4. Because here, after queen b4, the problem is that if we just obstinately go for rook h3, I just couldn't see this working. I felt that... In this version, this has no chance of success after g6. I feel like g6 here is a critical defensive move, and I didn't see a way for us to accumulate further attacking pieces on the king side. We, we can't go queen h4. That's the problem, and now we can't go queen h5. We can't get our queen on the h file, and so h7 pawn is safe. Yeah, bishop g5 maybe. Maybe this is the way to go. But to be honest, even if... Ah, if queen e7, then queen h4. Bishop g5 is really nice. I guess black has to trade. Ooh, but now we're getting to h6. Holy smokes, I didn't see bishop g5. That's such a elegant move, just trading off black's only defender. Hmm. So maybe bishop f4 was actually worth considering here. We'll check with the engine. Yeah, I didn't see this. I calculated up until this point, and I didn't see bishop g5. Excellent catch. I don't even know if black has a defense here. Again, queen e7, white plays queen h4 with a double attack. And this, this, is, this ends the game. Very interesting. We will have to check this with the computer. Anyways, we decided on a more conservative approach. Queen e4, dozen bees, gifting to Fihag. Thank you. Bishop takes d4. And this is where we decided to take the brazen risk that ultimately wins us the game and pays off. Initially, my idea was to take on d4 play rook cd1, and then take on b7. But with such a brilliant knight on d4, there is no way that black is worse here. Black can only be better. But that's when I spotted this idea of playing bishop g5. And the interesting thing, thank you, Jan42, for another gift. And sub. How did I generate this idea of the crazy rook sack on h7? So the first thing I saw when I looked at this position is that if black plays the move f6, 
The bishop on c4 controls the king's only escape square. So this almost works. This almost leads to mate. Unfortunately, the king is able to escape. But you actually don't need to sack the queen. You can just play rook h3 straight away. Now, there's a couple of subtleties that you have to be aware of. A lot of people would not make this move because you're worried about bishop takes f2 check. But this is a phantom concern. Because after king takes f2, queen takes d1 is no longer a check. And queen takes h7 is mate. Now, there's a crazy line here. Black can play fg check. And where should white's king escape to? What's the accurate move here for white? I think it's actually the only move. Whoa, 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 whoa. Not king e1 because you get mated. We go king g3. The king escapes the checks. The black queen has nowhere to move such that it defends h7 without giving itself up. Queen g6, queen takes g6, and the pawn is pinned. And there are no checks. No, not king e2, because then you take the rook with check. And not king e3, because of queen c5 check. So only g3. What a line. So if g6, then queen takes g6. If g6, then queen takes g6. Oh, wait! No. After g6, we have forced mate. Beautiful. Oh my god, after g6, we have rook takes h7. King h7, queen h4, and queen h6 checkmate. A very classic uh, pattern, by the way. I've seen this before. I've definitely seen this before. By the way, what's amazing is that this move loses. Because after bishop f2 check, king f2, fg check, the queen hangs. Black wins the queen on g6 in contrast to the other line. Absolutely amazing. And by the way, after bishop f2, you can't not take the bishop because then black grabs the rook with check and this is a mating attack. Wow, crazy lines. And if h6, then of course bishop takes h6 with, with mate. So that's what I saw. And that's what really attracted me to the move bishop g5. The fact that f6 is not possible. So rook c8 is a slightly weird move. I was expecting rook d7. Ultimately, I don't think... No, ultimately, that is what allows this combination to work. Because after rook d7, rook h3, queen g6, if we try to do the same thing that we did in the game, obviously, it doesn't work. Because the rooks are aligned with each other, and bishop takes f2 check leads to a rook trade. So what made this combination possible is the move rook c8, amazingly. I don't think rook c8 is a big mistake, provided that black would have followed up correctly in this position. So rook c8, rook h3. And I think the only way... Well, the question of how do you know, asks Truth the Bluff, how, to, how do you know when to start detecting these tactical ideas? Well, there's a bunch of articles on this. There's a book called The Tactical Detector. There's a book called Invisible Chess. I, I um, have an article on chess.com called The Tactical Detector. But basically, one surefire... Indicator is when, the, when your opponent's king is out of squares. So like the moment black plays f6, the black king has zero escape squares. And that is like an automatic short sign that you should start looking for like mating ideas. And obviously like when you have a bunch of pieces staring at the opponent's king, there's no secret. There's no crazy like intuitive ability. It's more like I've got pieces that are in the proximity in the vicinity of my opponent's king. So after rook h3, I think the key for black was to play f5. Here, if we sacrifice on h7, what I calculated at first was queen h4, king g6. I briefly got excited about the move bishop e2, threatening maiden 1, but it's way too slow, and black can defend with rook h8. It's way too slow, and black can defend with rook h8, and black consolidates the extra rook. So had black played f5, we would have gone queen h4. But here I think black can simply play h6. And while this looks impressive, in reality, white's pieces are just kind of stranded on the king on the king's side. Black threatens bishop takes f2 check. And things could get really bad here for white really, really quick. I just don't see a way for white to follow up on the attack. What we would have done in this position is the incredibly tricky move, sorry, queen e2. Who can tell me what queen e2 threatens? Like, what if black plays just sort of like a nonchalant move, like a6? 
Yeah, it creates a hidden threat. Rook h7 and queen h5, and suddenly the king is mated. Black has to give up the queen. So after queen e2, my guess is that black should play a move like queen g6. But okay, the game is not over. Then we play rook g3. And just notice that we have a lot of attacking potential. Nonetheless, we still have good practical attacking chances, even though I'm positive that the objective evaluation is probably something on the order of minus 1 or minus 1.5. Not disputing that white is worse here. Maybe h6 is the move. But it's not so easy for black to avoid blundering in a position like this. He gets a rook in a piece, though. But still, black's king is really, really weak. In that position, white is basically winning. The king is still going to be hunted there. So anyways, queen g6 is the fateful move. And after queen g6, f g6, anyone listening who has done a fair amount of puzzle rush should be familiar with this kind of idea of the sack on h7 followed by a mate on the h file. Uh, there, there's like a million different iterations of the same idea where you basically, the king is stuck on the h file, you sacrifice a piece to open the h file, and then you use a heavy piece, the remaining heavy piece, to deliver check on the h file. So, for example, a very simple example from one of my games, just to show you that like pattern recognition is actually a thing. It's not a invented concept, you know? This is a very simple example from one of my games. It's a crazy looking position, but I was able in this position to identify the typical tactical pattern. The bishop sits on e6, it covers the king's only escape square. And so the simple winning line is knight takes e5. My opponent was relying on e takes d3. The queen is hanging and the knight is hanging, but now knight takes g6 ends the game. Same exact concept. You clear the h file, and now queen h3 results in a very simple checkmate. Okay, so you should be familiar with the underlying concept. So if the white rook had already been on t3, everybody in this room should immediately understand that this is the mating concept. But I have also seen examples of combinations where you play a move like rook d3, it sounds absurd that black has no way to defend against mate, and yet that is exactly the case. But the bottom line is that it doesn't cost any money to test these types of lines in your mind. It's just such a nice position. It's such a beautiful position, because like the king is cut off, the other bishop sits on the g-pawns, not allowing black to create luft to the move g5. But what's craziest about this to me isn't even that there's no stopping rook h3. It's that after bishop f2, white is still winning with king h1. The craziest thing is what this bishop is capable of. It's defending f1 and g8, and both of those things are mission critical. So no matter where black's bishop goes, you're opening up the defense of the f1 square, reinforcing the threat of rook h3. Black found the most resilient defense, which is bishop h4, rook h3, and rook f4, but now we simply take back. And the g-pawns are doing our work for us. This is still mate. Black is forced to give up all of his pieces in order to clear the g6 square. By that point, it's too late. Knight d4 is another excellent move by our opponent, by the way. Setting a trap. Rook h4, king g6, and black is okay. But we first drop our bishop back, forcing the king back, and then we take on h4. Incredible, incredible idea. Um, maybe I'm overhyping it a little bit, but the fact that it happens in an end game, and the fact that Black as Bishop takes F2 check and it still doesn't help, and our king is basically mated, is just totally nuts. Chess is just such a crazy game. Like, we could be getting outplayed the entire time, and then all of a sudden there's this mating combination out of nowhere. And Oh, and, and the fact that the Bishop on G5 defends C1, the Bishop on C4 defends F1, and Black strokes are aligned on the F and C files, perfectly just where we need them to be. Yeah, the fact that the other bishop controls C1 is so crazy. Nuts. Absolutely nuts. But I hope you enjoyed the game, folks. Um, maybe the analysis at the beginning was a little bit too technical. If so, I apologize. But I, I really wanted to be thorough. I wanted to make sure that we had properly considered the opening. We can check really quickly before I finish the video. Uh, the engine assessment in a couple of key positions. Let's um, check the engine analysis in a couple of key positions before we uh, pause for today. So, 
Okay, actually, Queen G4 is best. So this, the computer actually likes this. Wow, we actually were playing really, really well. Yeah, Queen E4 immediately, and White is apparently better. Queen E4, the engine gives a small but stable edge for White, as you can see. A uh, dozen beasts, thank you. I, 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 um, I was not confident enough. I, I, I thought after Queen E4, there's F5. So I calculated this line, Queen E6, Bishop E6, F4. Bishop d2, knight d4, but I stopped here. And I thought there was like a, a double attack, but after the simple bishop g4, e2 square is defended and white has the bishop pair in, in an open board. Um, so the centralizing move, queen e4, would have been best. Instead, we went too brazenly with rook d3. Oh, f5 was best here. Yeah, after f5, this just puts us to shame. Queen e4 is good. But bishop f4 was actually best. Yeah, queen b3, rook h3, g6, bishop g5. And white is better. Or at least at least it's double-edged. So instead we went here. And of course this is a mistake. And that's kind of... Ooh, it's minus three. Oh, this was a big mistake. And of course, as I had told you guys, bishop d4, knight d4, rook cd1, e5, queen b7 was objectively best with an equal position. So why is this losing? Oh, and yeah, this is indeed winning. Why is this so losing? Oh, it's because of queen c5. Oh, and after bishop takes d8, queen takes c4. Oh, my lands. And there is a threat of bishop takes f2 check winning the white queen. So white ends up also losing the bishop on d8. Okay, that is crazy. Queen c5, bishop takes d8, queen takes c4, and then black gets two pieces for a rook and a pawn. And a monster bishop on d4. So white is losing. And, okay, white has to play b3 here. It's not totally over. But here, black can snag another pawn. It's still pretty complicated here, though. Like, white still has a bunch of attacking ideas, but apparently, just something like knight d4, the compensation is obviously insufficient. So, so much uh, depth hides be beneath the surface. But yeah, I'm still happy that I was able to find this. And then we did everything very cleanly. Excellent. Okay, guys. Hope you enjoyed the game. That was uh, that was a lot of fun. We're 2,200 plus. We're going to end the speed run around 2,300. So we're, we're nearing the end. But there will be a lot more content to be made afterward. So thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for hanging out. And I will see everybody later.